Well, hello, dear listeners and dear viewers, and welcome to another episode of the Global Advocate Career Podcast, where behind every career is a person worth knowing. Today, I have the pleasure, and I'm your host, in case you're wondering who I am, I'm your host, Michelle Clark Series. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing a dear friend who I admire and I'm thrilled to have on my show, Mr. Sandy Kennedy, CEO of Entrepreneurial Scotland. Sandy, welcome Michelle. to the Global Advocate Career Podcast. Such a pleasure to be here and just a real honor, to be honest, to, to spend time with you as well. You're a, you're a superstar. Sandy, thank you, but I miss you. We miss you. I it, miss you. We, we, we got to get over there soon. We really do. We do. Well, we, we miss you. We miss all the family and everybody. Um, and yeah, it's obviously very strange times at the moment. But one of the things that we've got to, all of us, I've got to really think about um, as we come out of it is how do we rebuild those connections? Because one of the things we can't do is become insular. We've got to be always looking out and you know, whether it's friendships or it's how we learn, then uh, yeah, we've got to keep doing it. So we, our door uh, is, is open to you and the family uh, as soon as possible. Same here, Sandy. Same here. Same here. May I read a mini bio about you? Oh, dear. <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. Sandy is passionate about unlocking Scotland's entrepreneurial potential, wherever it may be. He, he has over 20 years of experience in leading commercial, social, and charitable enterprises as an investor and an ecosystem builder. Prior to the formation of Entrepreneurial Scotland Foundation, he led a varied life, including founding an online imaging startup, working for the venture capital firm 3i, the turnaround of a 100-year-old and 3,000-employee family business, and being first member of the South Tier Foundation team. Sandy has a law degree from Cambridge, an MBA from the University of Oh, Strathclyde. Did I pronounce that right? That's spot on. Okay. And has worked closely on entrepreneurship with Babson College in Massachusetts for a decade. He writes a monthly column on entrepreneurship for the Herald newspaper. Sandy, when you listen to your accomplishments and what you're doing, how does it make you feel? I, well, it feels slightly odd, I think. I mean, I've always been somebody who I'm more interested in the difference that you make or how you make people feel than actually the, the boxes that you tick. So, and I don't know if that's, and I don't mean that to be false modesty, but I've, I've always really taken those things really in my stride. And the thing that very much uh, drives me, you know, gets me up in the morning, et cetera, is, is doing things I really care about and I'm passionate about it. And if that was um, in a one man band or working for somebody else or, or whoever it might be, I don't know. It's not really the title. It's not really the, the, the prestige. It's the opposite. It's actually what you can do with your life and how you can make a difference. That's right, Sandy. Now, for those who are not in Scotland, tell us exactly where you are right now. Where are you located? So I, so Scotland, everybody imagines that. So Scotland has a West and an East and on the West and uh, as we say in Scotland, West is best. So I live in Glasgow where all the fun people, creative people live, all the slightly more boring people live in Edinburgh. Um, and I live just North of that uh, towards a place uh, called Loch Lomond where there's a very famous song. So if you don't know that, look it up on Spotify. It's a, it's a great song. So I live between Glasgow and Loch Lomond. Um, in a very pretty part of the world, but it is uh, cold, it is very wet, and at this time of year it starts getting very dark. We have the joys in the summer of, of having, uh, where it almost doesn't get dark at all, but that means in winter it gets very dark. I can imagine, I can imagine, you're up north. Now, okay, uh, help me out here, Loch Lomond, pronounce it again? Loch Lomond. Okay, now... I'll what... take the high road and you'll take the low road. Okay. That's very good. It's a lovely song. Now, what does what is a lock? A lock is a lake. Ah, okay. So, <laughs> so 
why don't you guys just call it a lake? Oh, there's so many things that we should do differently in Scotland, but uh, no, we, we do have one lake in Scotland, but uh, people, it's a famous sort of uh, quiz question of what's the only lake in Scotland, so. Okay, well, I'll ask you that question later. Okay, for our listeners that are not based in Scotland, here's some fun facts about your beautiful country. It's Thank about you. the size of South Carolina and twice the size of the Netherlands. Um, the capital is Edinburgh. Edinburgh, right? Edinburgh. Edinburgh, okay. And one of your national symbols is the thistle. Very much so. Um, what is one thing that you want your listeners to know about Scotland that they cannot find out on YouTube or Instagram? Oh, that's a tricky question. I think you might get a wee bit of a feel from it from what you see but we have a, as a as a people we're very friendly very welcoming very warm and um, enjoy a good laugh as well and um, hard working um, so i would say the bit that you just never can get from instagram or or youtube is what it feels like to be sitting with a crackling fire maybe a whiskey in your hand having a good chat uh, with the warmth and friendship all around you that you will find in scotland man I'm, I'm on my way. I don't know how I'm going to get there. You're welcome. I'm on my way. So, Sandy, you're the CEO of Entrepreneurial Scotland. Tell us about your organization. Absolutely. So, so we're a charitable organization. Uh, we work very closely with the Scottish government and the UK government, but we're fully independent uh, and very much working under our own means. Um, our, our, I suppose our founding philosophy is that it's entrepreneurial people um, at all different stages who will shape uh, Scotland's, I would argue, the world's future. Um, and therefore, what we're about is how can we, with our programmes, with our team, with our voice, our, our uh, I suppose, our agitation, um, our, and we have a very big community, how can we help your, the current entrepreneurial leaders and the future ones think, act and lead in an entrepreneurial way? Okay, so tell me what a day in the life looks like for you at the office. Well, obviously in the current times, a day in the life is, is very much, I'm, I'm at my desk. Um, in normal times, I'd be out and about. I'd be uh -huh. meeting a lot of people, um, you know, possibly in Scotland, but I, I spend quite a bit of time in the US. Um, down in London, in Europe, uh, and to a lesser extent in Asia. And what I'm doing there is I'm taking the, the, the mission the, of, of Entrepreneurial Scotland out, particularly to the Scottish diaspora, and, and persuading them to, to support it. So a typical day would be, um, or currently now, would be we have a senior team leader, leaders meeting first thing, and that's what we do. And we've been doing that every day since COVID struck. Wow. Uh, and we do that for about 45 minutes. And then we build, then we start effectively, the senior team, we go to, to the wins. We then have uh, sub team meetings that are going on. Uh, we use a methodology called Kanban, which comes out of um, uh, uh, Japan and, and is around sort of the agile methodology, which really helps keep the, the rhythm and pace of what we're doing. And then my day will be a blend of, a pro, I suppose, you know, a replication of what I did before, which was meetings, catching up with people, keeping connections strong. Um, you know, whilst we're a charity, there's an element of sales going on. So I'm either sure. selling a vision, I'm selling, trying to persuade somebody to support a young person, you know, philanthropically, or open up an opportunity through an internship or for somebody to join a program. So there's quite a bit, as it were, of selling, but selling things I think will make a big difference. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of it that I do a lot of is having to write papers and that sort of stuff. So, you know, if I look this week, I've um, written quite a few papers this week, but one of them was for Scottish government looking at um, the role of entrepreneurship in the post COVID recovery and that, you know, how you take people who are really not that close to the business or entrepreneurial community and take them through a pathway, why this is really important. Sure. Or would be an example of it. So it's so a blend of different things, but it's, it's a lot of, I suppose the other thing I've written a couple of articles this week that have been published. Mm -hmm. So there's 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 a range of internal and external. Now, on your on Entrepreneurial Scotland's Twitter account, 
It reads, our vision is for Scotland to be the most entrepreneurial city in the world again. Tell us about when it was that vision before. Good question. And uh, I probably should have finished my, my previous um, explanation with that sort of punchline. So first thing is it's not the most entrepreneurial city, the most entrepreneurial society. So Excuse me, I misspoke, sorry, society. Don't worry. No, no, but society meaning it's about a community and it's about a complete community. It's not one that is either it's okay, because I think sometimes entrepreneurship can be seen as, well, if you do really well, you earn a lot of money and yes. then you leave everybody behind and you live in your gated community driving your fancy cars. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about here um it's about society it's about being inclusive um and that's across all the different um strands of what inclusivity means because i believe that entrepreneurship and i'm meaning a very broad definition of entrepreneurship is good for the whole of society and that means we can we can see people be entrepreneurial in the public sector in the charitable sector we have a very vibrant social enterprise sector in scotland as well so so just to sort of clarify what i mean by that so your very good question about dot, dot, dot again was there was a period in probably sort of late 17th century into the 18th and then flowed into the 19th century where Scotland um, was at, for a very small country, we've only got a population of you know, 5.6 million now, but and then obviously it was much less then. We were at, we had four universities when England only had two. Right. Um, we had, um, I think, and I, somebody may be able to correct it, but I think we had the first mass education. So therefore, irrespective of from the poorest background, you could get an education in oh. the world. Um, so therefore, what you had was education was central to the development of Scotland. And when, um, and this is maybe the, the nether regions of UK history, mm -hmm. but when Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland came together to form or Ireland at that time, came to form um, Great Britain, then what you had in Scotland was, a, a, I suppose, a, not an intellectual, but a, a, you know, an educated uh, community who then went to the world and went all over the world. And then at home, you had people who, who were you know, right at the front of the field. So we lay claim to inventing the TV, to inventing penicillin, and um, we lay claim to inventing the telephone. We lay claim to inventing uh, the MRI scanner. We lay claim to inventing, um, whether you agree with it or not, the dolly the sheep, the, you know, the first genetically <laughs> modified um, uh, sheep um, oh, really? and, and a whole pile. So we, we, we have probably per head one of the highest levels of of invented inventiveness and you know at various points we've had the most number of patents per head of population so uh -huh. what i mean by that as dot 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 again is there was a point in um you know that all came to to the core in the sort of mid early to mid 19th century where glasgow was and in particular from a trading perspective and ember from a financial perspective were two of the most successful cities in the world, but it was based on mass education and it was based on um, your trade and, and entrepreneurial verve. Now, don't get me wrong, and this is maybe an area, Michelle, you want to explore, mm -hmm. is what were the costs of that? You know, there were there was there was there was clearly um, some issues there and, and we may want to get into them. But at that point in time, what I'm interested in is the the sort of um, inventiveness the get up and go the we call it the can-do spirit um that scotland really had in spades there and if we translate that into the world that we're in now and took that same sort of raw energy and intellectual horsepower and applied it to things like um your know, net zero carbon we applied it to the well-being economy we applied it to other areas of inclusivity that are really important to the world at the moment um, then actually maybe we could be the most entrepreneurial society again. And even if we don't get there, the aspiration is a great driver for us to do it. And because we've done it once before, then it seems possible. You mentioned aspiration. Do you think aspiration is enough to be an entrepreneur or does it need to be taught as well? Definitely needs to be taught as well. You need, you need you know, asp aspiration. So to be a pure entrepreneur, then passion, aspiration, you know, resilience, great, all those things are, you know, 
I suppose tools or attributes you have to have. However, if you you can have all those things and they'll still not succeed if you don't have the skills mm. that you need to go alongside it. And those skills can definitely be taught. Um, and the sort of the attributes, the sort of mindsets can be honed and, and, and strengthened like anything, you know, that you're, it's hard to say, how can you be more resilient? But there are ways that you can build resilience. So let's talk about the different areas that Entrepreneurial Scotland focuses on. Um, one of them is developing, finding and developing talent. How has that been going for you? It's, so it, I suppose starting from the, the, the problem first mm -hmm. is what, and this is a sort of a, it's much a feel for a problem as, as you know, having lots and lots of evidence. But what we were feeling, and lots of people were feeling, not, not just me and, and others, is that we've got some really, really smart young people coming through our education system. However, a lot of them either don't fulfill their potential or need to fulfill their potential outside of Scotland. So what would happen is they, you know, that potential would be there and it gets it drops off or they end up being super successful in New York or super successful in um, Paris or, or wherever it might be, Tokyo, whatever. And the question was, well, why is that? Um, so, so that was, I suppose, the problem statement that we were we were looking at. And so, what we've done there is we've, and, and, I, and we're only a bit of the jigsaw, so we're not claiming to by any stretch be the solution uh, in in its entirety. Is we created an, an internship program, which was absolutely no cost uh, and no barrier to entry. Indeed, we worked really hard on our what we call widening access. I people come from the sort of the, the sort of bottom 10 percent of of schools etc uh, and by the way i'm talk, talking here at university internship or right. sort of just penultimate year so right i think rising senior in in a u.s terms okay uh, um so what we did was set up a program and and it, in, initially it was based around you know this is what we wanted to look like but this is what it really does look like now it now is the blue ribbon program that everybody who's aspiring to 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 achieve something um, wants to be on. And it's, you know, it's a badge of honor that appears on their LinkedIn profile or on the CVs. And we started with, um, I think four interns, uh, and this is you know, going into Liberty Mutual into Boston in, um, I think it was summer 2007. And now this year, or not this year, we would have done, this year we were on track to have between 200 and 220 scholarships, which wow. is from, our, from a country like ours, from every single university uh, in Scotland. So it's completely open to every single one of them. Um, and as a result, the, what you get is it's not just the, you know, the 200 who then go and do these world-class internships all over the world. What it is, is before they go, we we sift that down from, or well, certainly in terms of interest, probably three to 4,000 people who are interested. And then, you know, there's a big moment in January where we interview around 750 of them to then work out how we're doing. So imagine doing 750, well, each person's interviewed twice, 1,500 interviews in the space of about three days. Oh my. Um, I can, that's, there's a whole thing around that which might be quite interesting but then we filter that down and down and down and but so that so that already by the time they even go on their internship they are an ambassador for themselves ambassador mm -hmm. for the firm and the university but they're also an ambassador for Scotland and that has a number of ripple effects they do their internship but then they come back and they're part of a community so what we do is we build a community up around them so there's now 1400 of them and they're, they're seeping into all aspects of Scottish life. And we run a number of programs that are like it, but maybe for a bit older. So what happens now, you know, I didn't, I sort of talked about it 13 years ago, but where we're at now is being a Saltar scholar or a Saltar fellow or a Saltar leader is a real badge of honor. And they all start connecting and the network connects right. together. So some, somebody used a good expression, which I don't know if this works in the US, but is, we used to have in the UK, the old boys network. So this is this is like the new people's network that we're building here, so. How, 
how does it make you feel the fact that you're actively changing people's lives through this program um, and giving them an opportunity to not only gain experience but professionally but also personally so it's 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 very humbling to be honest is how i feel about it it doesn't it doesn't um and the best the moment that i feel that is it's usually at the back of a room in mid-september where all these young people who have been away for the summer come back and then they stand up on stage and they talk to their experience and I, I the thing I, I have to do a lot of public speaking and all that sort of stuff but that day I do none it's the team who run it and it's the heroes are the interns that have just come back and I stand at the back of the um of the room usually with a beer in my hand and just smile and just feel wow that's amazing so so my moments of satisfaction i guess are more when i'm in the shadows at the back and i'm watching other people lit up and doing what they do and that that's i don't know it may sound strange but that's what gives me the the buzz um of it it's and then what i love about it is it's got its own momentum you know you could take me out of it or take our team out of it this will continue this will keep rolling so it's it's as much it has is akin to building a movement um it's got that sense of internal energy to keep it going now sandy you started this foundation you were actually the first staff or employee right back in 2001 i was in 2007 yeah no 2007. Actually, i've got my dates right wrong 2009 eight nine i can't remember yeah okay. no i was the first employee but i wasn't actually the person who came up with the first idea so i always like to credit um, everybody with it. So what, what it was, was it was a group of very, very successful Scots based mm -hmm. in America, who were looking back in Scotland, who were saying, and saying different things, but a number of things they were saying were, there's so much raw potential here. How do we unlock it? And then it was them who said, well, how about if we did X, Y, and Z? And what they were missing was somebody who can make it happen. So why well, was the guy who came in and um, made it happen, I guess, um, and brought it, brought their ideas and dreams and, and turned it into reality. So as a columnist for the Herald, you wrote, you recently wrote an article on internships. It actually, it actually was entitled, Internships are a vital way to unlock potential. And you gave an interesting statistic 57% of the participants in your program were women. Why do you think that's the case? So, so there's, so I don't have the, I don't have the actual answer. So this is a feeling rather than it. But I think the reason is, is because the way our process works. So our process works at the beginning bit, if you imagine that like a funnel at the top, yes. is we're wanting to get as many people with as much uh, diversity, both across every slider of what diversity means into the funnel. And therefore, for instance, we work really hard with, um, so what, again, what we call widening access groups. So we work with all the, the widening access teams on the university campuses. We work with uh, other charities who, are very supportive of widening access because the biggest barrier first biggest barrier is people don't apply because they don't think they're going to get it mm, so okay. therefore if you do, whereas so therefore to answer your question and that applies not just to women but that applies to certain types of um other other groupings especially when this is badged as this is blue chip this is like blue ribbon this is a stellar this is you know it's going to change your life and all this and then they also see all these alumni coming mm. through who look amazing they've done amazing things and all that sort of stuff that is a barrier to a lot of people to get on it so to answer your question i think we work really hard at saying you just try you can do it and people like you have done it so that's the first point the second point is and this is going to be on maybe unfair to to many males but not all of them for sure that is that I think women, once they set, get their mindset on something, they're much more um, 
rigorous and following it through. We, we get it done, Sandy. You can say That's that maybe right a better, here. Fair way of putting it. So, so, so as an example, this process starts with probably an information session in September, an application, pretty chunky application that needs to be completed in November, an interview that's got to be prepared for and really nailed in uh, January. Mm-hmm. And then that only gets you into the, into the playing field. Then wow. it's then it's pitching for internships, writing, uh, just making sure you uh, tweaking your resume and getting the um, your your particular ask why that internship and not the others. So it takes that kind of rigor and that consistency and that your some males can blow hot and cold. But if they're not if they're not getting their application in on time or they're not turning up to interview with their A game or if they're not getting the other stuff in, then they don't get on. So. So I think there's that, and then, and this is a quote from a female, one of, a female trustee. She thinks that women present better at the various stages than men. Men, men at that age of typically between sort of twenty to twenty four, and we do take mature students as well on it, um, but particularly that age, women just present better. They they come across more clearly than than many men who are maybe a bit more garbled. Well, I, I think it's also mes- messaging at the top, right? Let's take a look at the Scottish government for a minute. Your first prime minister, Nicola Sturgeon, is a woman, right? She is. You have six, about six, if I counted correctly, female cabinet secretaries and seven female ministers. And in terms of diversity, right? Your cabinet secretary for justice is a first generation Muslim Scot. Yeah. So, and the youngest to serve. So what is it about Scotland that other countries should follow suit? What is it about you that are just encouraging such a, a mo- lovely amount of diversity? Yeah, and, and it also, if you look at, I mean, this has changed slightly, but the, there was a point where, was it last year, two years, so the, the, the main opposition party is um, the, the Conservatives who are more towards the right but the conservatives which you bear in mind this is right leaning um sort of more you know pro business and um, was led by a, a lesbian female in wow. scotland so therefore you had nicholas sturgeon and you had ruth davidson and they were seen at that point in time as probably the two best politicians in the uk not just in scotland they were seen so there was a whole movement for ruth davidson potentially to become the leader instead of boris johnson so so there is something going on, and I, I, I don't know the answer, but my guess would be a combination of our our Scottish Parliament is relatively new. It was created in two thousand, so it's got twenty years of life. So mm-hmm. it started from scratch. So therefore, it's not got maybe some of the embedded systems that maybe create that bias. I think secondly. It was. It's. It seemed more achievable. It goes back to some of the things that you know. I'm sure Michelle, you've talked about this many times. But maybe women, in my experience, more than than men, sometimes set their bar on where they think they can get to, rather than right. So therefore, and if they if they're setting their bar lower, because maybe they're more they're realistic, and that's it. Whereas you've got males who frankly think they can take over the world, irrespective of their of some of their don't get me wrong, there's very talented um, men, but there's that that's not not maybe they're not as good as judging that. Then what you have is that a lot of men will go for stuff and women won't. Um, and in Scotland, I think people said, no, this is local. This is something I care about. I can do something about it. So I think it, the 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 volume of women that were there to pick from, as it were, went up. And then and then there was a very deliberate policy, uh, particularly by Nicola Sturgeon. She's now been um first minister for six years mm-hmm. um to make to to start equalizing the cabinet so it's it, she has worked really hard to make the cabinet for instance to be 50 50. and you know there's there's a lot of people who would say um well you can't do that surely you should just pick the best person for the job personally and particularly in that field i think maybe but if we have to deliberately signal that this really really matters and you've got to do it right from the top as you say then maybe that's what we have to do well i think that's phenomenal and 
it's a reference, a positive reference point for other countries that uh, probably need to do more of that sort of an approach. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, you, have you got an election going on? Or <laughs> um, yes, we do, and yeah. and, and um, I, I think it's I think it's phenomenal. And, and you know, it, Scotland, for all intents and purposes, you know, when you think of Scotland, you think, yeah, that's pretty white, right? You think it's yeah, pretty well, Caucasian, it right? Well, and is. and here it is, uh, just this such progressive. Um, initiatives. Let's go back to uh, the Entrepreneurial Scotland. In addition to having an internship program, you also help existing businesses, correct? Yeah, we do. We And we what we focus in on is the person rather than the business. So our focus, there's other organizations who are very much there to support the business. We're there in the belief that if you have a, a really strong talent pipeline and a very strong leadership uh, then they will look after most of the other stuff. Um, so, yeah, so we, we run programs that uh, enable probably the, if you imagine sort of the, will be in US terms, like an MBA type of stage. Right. So late 20s into your 30s. So we run programs for that sort of phase. And then we also run programs which tend to be shorter and sharper for your more senior leaders. And yeah, I suppose some common characteristics of, of, of all those programs is we uh, try where we or we, we work very hardly and the hard and this is why we work with Babson is because we're looking for world class teachers and not just people who are good at teaching or are academics, but actually people who've been there and done it and can really bring it to life. The second big thing that we do is a large chunk of peer to peer. So how do you how do you get a peer group to start sharing a lot of both their experiences and, and how they can help each other, but also their, their fears and their challenges. So therefore you get that. that. And, and the reason for that is not only does it give a richer learning environment, it also gives a, um, there's a sort of like a social fabric that builds up between them so that when they come back out of the program, there's, there's a real strength. So just see a mirror of what I was talking about with the interns, that you're building that social, connectivity we do that as well with the other groups as well and then we try and effectively bind them all together um, which is also which is a, a worthwhile exercise and then the final bit that we're always sort of driving at, and this is much easier to be honest with an entrepreneurial community or entrepreneurially minded people right is about curiosity and that is about get you know pre-covid it's by getting them out of the country get them seeing other places talking to people who aren't like them exploring their ideas and what happens you get two sides one is they go oh i never even thought like that before i didn't know that that kind of idea existed and mm -hmm. they, they they embrace that and that just you know fires them up but also what we see and this applies to the interns as well you know we've had interns and, and business leaders go to you know mit um, or into in the interns case into you know, a, a Wall Street firm and come out of it going saying, actually, I'm just as good as everybody else. You know, we're we're a small country at the top of Europe with just the Arctic Arctic um, ice cap above us while it's still there. Um, and we sometimes have a bit of an inferiority complex. Whereas if we travel the world and come back and go, no, we're not that bad. We could always improve here, here and here. And then so that, so that would be the three big components of all the programs is world class teaching wherever it may be peer to peer and always looking for ways of stimulating a, a broader view and i i or we believe that travel and you're speaking to be other people outside of your bubble is vital to them has the fact that we're in a pan pandemic has that made your vision more challenging or do you find it actually making individuals more flexible both of those both of those the 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 challenging part is certainly historically and we'll we'll maybe learn this but relationships and trust builds up usually particularly strongly face to face it's yes. harder to build trust without that so therefore and it's not just face to face, it's about shared experience. So therefore, the more that you can share an experience, um, 
then that's where that sort of that those bonds of trust and through trust you get deeper sharing deeper learning all these different things so that is a much harder side having said all that a couple of other drivers that are pushing the other way which are one is need so we've got we've just started a program this in the summer four or five weeks after lockdown because we were looking at all our programs were effectively trashed and what could we do because they're all finding that so we did so what we did we did a partnership with babson where we took uh online taught modules around things like innovation um, and then uh, attached to a peer-to-peer -peer, sort of one month, one year peer-to-peer -peer program off the back of it so you had some deep learning and then a peer-to-peer -peer engagement the most popular program that we have uh, we offered a number of different topics the most popular topic was conscious leadership so conscious how do you, so is how do you as a leader now particularly now but also bearing in mind you know the the sustainability agenda and all these other different things that are and obviously there was the you know the whole black lives matter and and all that that's you know really uh, bubbling up at the moment is how do you use a leader of a firm or a social enterprise really what does that mean to you what's your clarity of purpose and that sort of stuff that was the most popular program that we put on now firstly if it hadn't been for this would we have been able to do it but the other bit is, would they have been able to accept, access this sort of thing? They're too busy doing lots of other things. Whereas this has been a jolt to people who've, got, who've had time to stop and go, why am I doing all this? What, what, does it, what really matters to me most here? And a lot of them are going, I know it's over there, but I've got to develop a whole new skill set. I've got to think differently. I've got to expose myself to new networks and try new things. So like anything, there's a yin and yang to it. Um, and I, I would say being entrepreneurial, you've just got to go with the cards as they fall and you just play through it. Um, and you know, as long as we hold that element of optimism that the, the, the future's brighter, then yeah, you work your way through it. So. Do you think, you mentioned the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement, and do you, do you see uh entrepreneurship changing uh willingly under this new paradigm that we're in or do you see it, it you know people wanting to hold on to the way things were so so if we just hold on the black lives matter movement first bit and i'll come to that in a second but just generally i think we are in a about your point there by are people wanting to hold on to the past or you move to a new future. I think I think we're at a, a tipping point on that. And I think that there are a lot of people who just want it to go back to how it was. And there's a lot of people of which I would say, and the entrepreneurial side tend are tending to move forward and say, actually, it's never going to be the same again. And we just need to get on with it. So, so I'm probably spending more time with the people who are moving through it than than average because there, there's a lot of people going going back. I, I firmly believe it's not, it's, we're through it now. And I think I was speaking to somebody the other day um, who the way he put it was, he thinks Christmas is actually a defining moment. It's when people go through Christmas and New Year and if it's still the same, then they're going, no, no, this is for good. And it's a, so I don't, whether that's true or not, but I just thought it was an interesting way of, of seeing yes. sort of the, that tip point. But to come back to your, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think we don't know yet because I think that um, there's been some very important conversations. I mean, at a, a community and a society level, I think there's a lot of people more conscious of it. And, and in the UK, we have a different version of it. And in Scotland, we have a different version of it. You know, we're in, sorry, this is a wee sidebar more for, for people who don't know Scotland, but Scotland's, Scotland's population, we don't have a lot of, of immigration. We have, a, we have the opposite of what everybody else fights against. We want immigration because we have a decline, we have an aging population that then means that we're, um, we need immigration of all kinds into Scotland. So therefore, and but because we're right at the top of the world, then not that many people come here. So, so therefore, we we want to welcome more and more and more people. Um, but that means that we have quite a homogenous population. 
-hmm. So therefore it's, it's, now that doesn't mean we don't have racism, we definitely do. Doesn't mean we don't have systemic racism, we definitely do. But it's less, um, what's the word? It, I, in a bizarre way, I think it's more resoluble because actually we can turn around and go, actually, no, this is not good enough. We're gonna to have to do something about it. Whereas, from, and I don't want to be a, a looking into the US, it's so woven into your history. It's so woven into so many different pieces that it's a much harder thing to address. But the point, the point I was getting to before that was, just, was more to set context. It's maybe easy for me to say this in Scotland because Scotland, I, I don't even know the percentages, but my guess would be 80% is, is sort of white Scottish or white, UK, it's it's really homogenous. Yes, it's 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 quite homogenous. Hold hold that thought for a minute because I, I want to ask you a, a question about identity. Since we're talking yep. about movements that deal with identity, the Scottish identity is one that is quite um, prominent, right? Um, do you think that Brexit and now COVID? Are, is this an opportunity where Scottish identity is being strengthened or it's being challenged? I think it's definitely being strengthened at the moment, whether I'm, and this is, I'm talking here more about nationalism rather yes. than about identity of you know, who I am or who my family is or your, you know, which your tribes I belong to. But, and, and I know this is something that the, Scottish National Party, so-called, wrestle with as well, is that nationalism in Europe has, has we've got very wary um, concerns about where nationalism goes from, obviously, what you know, went on in the 20th century. Um, so nationalism can be a dangerous thing if, it, if that is the sole thing around identity. But if identity gives you strength to say, no, we can stand up and do be better we're we're citizens of the world but we're also going to be you know inclusive internally as well as externally i'm not i'm not putting that very well what i'm getting at is i i worry so the answer to your question is definitely stronger but we have to be careful that that strength doesn't be caught come because we're defining ourselves as oh we don't want to be with those brexiteers or we right. don't want to be with england or we are different because we do this and anything that uses identity to to show define boundaries and create walls and create barriers and very care wary of because I, you know where that can go whereas where identity can be about being open and being you know to use the first minister's example as being you know laying out a, a vision of what leadership could look like and that sort of stuff I think it's very very profound and so I, I've got there's probably some academic research behind this, but I've got a theory that during times of significant disruption, then strong, um, well um, connected communities tend to flourish. So if you look at, I don't know, through the Renaissance in, in Europe, what you had was a number of city states, um, you know, Venice being an example, or right. Florence, uh, and they really flourished because they were able to be nimble. They were able to be really focused their limited resources in the right way or the most effective way, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas big empires or or monolithic hierarchical structures really struggle during times of disruption and you know covid on top of what we've got but we're in the fourth industrial revolution we've got major shifts in cultural shifts we've got maybe maybe economic shifts in terms of um you know where the 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 balance of power is economically we've got massive issues around climate we're in a period of huge disruption therefore and this links back to the original point about being an entrepreneurial society i believe that an entrepreneurial society, one that's inclusive, that one that's fair, one that is is you know enables talent from wherever they may be to rise to the top, that is where strength will come from to to navigate the choppy seas of of this um, volatility that we're seeing at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it seems it it does seem quite daunting right now, but we will get through this. Where we do will. you see the where do you see Entrepreneurial Scotland in two years? 
two years is a really good time horizon because we and this is this is being very very honest is that we and so we we brought on created on pro scotland in 2014 by bringing two organizations together and we went out with this big kata of we we're going to help scotland become the most entrepreneurial society in the world and we got a big lot of energy and and activity around it and and i, I do think we shifted the dial and in, in people believing that might be possible and getting right. government involved and that sort of stuff but when you then strip that down you say well were we doing enough actually at the grassroots level of what we're doing so so without sort of sort of bursting that sort of balloon as it were the next two years is going to be all about delivery it's going to be all about making the difference for those interns those leaders and so it's going to be much it's going to have i think the outer surface of that same sort of vision and um, direction of travel ambition but at its core it's going to be much tighter on delivery and execution against that so so in, ter in terms of two years time i think the outer core will probably look pretty similar but the actual you know essence of what we'll do is we'll be do we'll be be able to do more programs for more people do them faster more nimbly have um maybe more partnerships with others etc so that the community in which we're trying to nurture is better served so sandy how do you balance your work and personal life how do you do it so i'm going to steal a quote from a dear friend uh, who is the and i noticed christine's not by the way not in the house at the moment so she would she would wrestle me to the ground for for saying this but Professor Les Charm is a dear friend. He's at Babs, and if, if if you want to see him, look him up on on YouTube, and you can see him in action. And he's a pretty gruff Bostonian. And I asked him the same question. He turned to me and he said, "Sandy, there's no such thing as a work-life balance. All you have is life. How you choose to use your life is up to you. But there's don't create something. So, so how do I create that balance? At times, very badly." At times, I think really well, but what I do is I try and, you know, I suppose, be consistent about what is it I'm trying to do, and that includes not, oh, I, my work's really important to me, and my family comes second, or my family's first, my work is second. It's all important to me, and I need to get that recognized in amongst that, that I may get that tweak the dial the wrong way or the other way. As long as I feel I'm making a difference. I'm being a good you know, father, as good a father as I can be, a good partner, a good brother. Probably don't speak to my sisters as much as I should. Now you're making me think. I'm oh, 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 um, <laughs> um, for my for my mom. Um, that's all we can do is I, I'm a big believer that you know somebody by their way they act and the way they behave as much as you know them by what they say. Um, so. That's right. Leading by example. Now you're looking at your children. Do you see them exhibiting entrepreneurial spirit? Uh, definitely, but in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, and then just again to, I've said it earlier, but just to repeat it is, so for me, this is not about being an entrepreneur. This is about being entrepreneurial. So therefore there's, you can be anything but if you inject being entrepreneurial into it, then that will that makes a huge yes, difference. Yes. So, so if I take take my three kids, I've got one who's very academic and currently is at university and Greek philosophy is his favorite thing in the world, right through to my youngest who's not um not very academic, so or maybe will be. So I don't want to pigeonhole them as and it's not being so. Um, but he he's very sporty and very personable and everything as well so um i think we get that range of different different things but so if i look at rudy the older one yes he's into greek philosophy yes he does all these different things but this summer he worked as a roofer which is somebody who goes up and roofs and puts tiles on it and that was all his doing fantastic and he ended up asking the the guy who ran the roofing company who also worked roofs with him your, so he worked out how did he get his clients what was it that was done how he worked out his margin and he also was getting up at five o'clock in the morning and getting on the van and being in the yard at you know half six to be able to do a job now this is the same guy who likes to talk about 
Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. Sure. So I, so I, I do think for all the kids, and I would urge for everybody, finding that complete range of activity is so essential. Sandy, you know, we could talk forever, but we're coming to the end of the podcast, but there's a section that I call, wait, what? Where I ask interesting questions, hoping to elicit interesting responses. Are you ready? Sounds good. Well, right. and, and, but, but as you can see as well, it's getting dark here at the moment. I uh, can see you. Good, you still see me. I'm just gonna shut the door if you don't mind quickly. You can do anything you'd like. The, joy, the joys of COVID are the dog comes barging in. So we have a dog. Oh, there you go. yeah, that's right. Okay. So I'm now ready. Ready you're, for it. You're ready for it. My first wait, what question is, have you actually seen the Loch Ness Monster? Yes. I can't tell you about it. I'm born to sweet and sworn to secrecy. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. True or false? You always use thermal underwear when wearing a kilt. Absolutely false, <laughs> utter, utter false. Um, any underwear of any kind is frowned upon. So, okay, no, even thermal, never wear it. That's crazy because it's pretty cold in Especially, Scotland. Yeah, exactly. All right, it's a true Scotsman then. Yeah, and and the thing is. And I know it, it, it's a bit of a story that everybody says it's true, but it is what people do. And it's, it's one of these, and there's an interesting psychological thing is because everybody says it's true, then the, all our Scottish males have to tell our children that it's true, <laughs> so therefore they do it. So it is it, all it is is a repeating myth going around and around in circles. So it, it, it's got no basis on original truth, but it is now a truth. It's just... Okay, well, hey, in Scotland, you do as the Scots do, I suppose. That's true, what they say. True or false? According to the CIA report, it is considered rude to wave one's hand or call or to call someone when summoning a waiter at a restaurant. Is that true or false? So, just generally, this is CIA. I would have thought it was rude to wave your hand at a waiter. That is correct. It is true. It is considered rude in England and other parts to wave your hand. True or false? Scotch eggs have scotch in them. False. That's correct. Edinburgh. Scotch eggs, have eggs in them. That's right. That's right. <laughs> maybe maybe some scotch in it wouldn't hurt. Yeah, that's true. True or false? Edinburgh is considered the Athens of the North. Absolutely true. It was. Oh, I can see if I can remember. It was a French. Um, philosopher from the 19th century who said it. I, can't remember. I want to say Descartes or something like that, but it wasn't him. It was one of the other ones. That's correct. That's correct. Simple Minds or Primal Scream? Both from Glasgow. Which one's your favorite? Um, so I'd have to say Simple Minds and I've seen there's a there's a iconic music venue called the Barrowlands and I saw Simple Minds in the Barrowlands so a big stadium um, act but seeing them in this really low uh, venue was incredible however I do have a soft spot for Primal Scream because of particularly Song Loaded and I think back to probably actually Michelle, our time together back in the in the oh, club. You mean in the eighties? You mean back in the eighties? <laughs> early, we might even get away with early nineties. Um, but the song loaded, and do you want to have a party? Do you have a good time? That's right. That's, That's right. It. Yep. Do you prefer disco or heavy metal? Oh, definitely disco over heavy metal. Me too. I love this. Yeah. Music. True. I don't. I don't mind. I respect heavy metal, Me but I definitely. Um, did you know, I mean, ACDC, the, the two uh, young brothers mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, the original Lee Sung, um, I forgot his name now. Anyway, I forget his name too. But they were both from Scotland. They're all from Scotland. Really? Yeah, they moved to Australia when they were in their teens. Oh. Bon Scott, that was the other ACDC, that was the original singer of ACDC. What's his name? And I've, I've actually met Michael Young as well, the ACDC bass guitarist. 
the crazy the, he's just he's just crazy was he, was Yo, he nice? the crazy crazy one's his brother angus uh, um, angus. Hair, it's, it's the it's the guy who writes the songs and in the background with his bass guitar i met that one so was i he was nice? i was he was actually really quiet super quiet and tiny like i mean i'm not exactly huge <laughs> But he was at least a foot smaller than you, Michelle. So. Oh my goodness! <laughs> you know, in my mind, I'm six two. And that's true. So, he, so he's five two. Then there you go. True or false? You are actually related to the Kennedy family here in the U.S. Actually, well, I'm sure I'm related to our Kennedy family in the U.S., but not the one I think you're referring to. No, I'm not. The again, the, I, you're probably, I'm probably boring everybody senseless, but the Kennedy, the Kennedys split. So there's a um, a Scottish set of Kennedys, which are down the sort of the west side of Scotland, which then looks on to the east side of of Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. So he was he was from the Ireland side. So we we probably threw rocks at each other, you know, two hundred years ago across the Irish Sea. But we were very much the Scottish west coasters rather than the Irish ones. So so you could be distantly related. <laughs> Um, I'm probably more distantly related to you, Michelle, than uh, <laughs> that, That's excellent. That's good. You got me there, Sandy. You got me there. <laughs> True or false? The Scottish national animal is a unicorn. Yeah, that is true, actually. And if you see so the crest they have used a uk crest usually have a lion rampant and a unicorn and that's to show the coming together of the two countries i don't oh. think most people in scotland know that to be honest wow so. that i that didn't find that in my research last two questions true or false the highest number of redheads is in norway <gasps> oh we'd love to say yes and no to that but they're probably the redheads came from the vikings so i'm going to say it's true that the highest number of redheads in norway false the highest oh, number no. of redheads are in sure. scotland yay <laughs> and finally sandy if go, you're I'll go all right till that point <laughs> not uncompetitive <laughs> last question True or false, if your name wasn't Sandy, it would be Rocky instead. Is that, is that a statement or a question? I, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's both. <laughs> question, okay then, yes, it would be Rocky instead. Sandy, you were fantastic, you know, we could do a part two because you're so fascinating. Your work is phenomenal. Um, your role is just so integral and is making such a significant impact. An hour doesn't do it justice, but I'm so happy that I had the chance to interview you and get to know what you're doing. And will you come back? Will you come back to the Global Advocate and tell us how things are going in two years? Uh, Michelle, it'd be my pleasure, and it would be a pleasure as well because I'm conscious you've got a lot of people who are listening to this who are looking at their either their careers or looking at hiring, etc. And there's a, I'm seeing some really interesting things around how people look at that and and also the hiring side. So it'd be a, it'd be my honour, Michelle, to do that. Absolutely, we'll have you come back again and have some uh, and talk about some other topics. How's that after the election? Delighted to do that. That'd be great, Sandy. Love you dearly. Love your family dearly. Thank you, dear listeners. Thank you, dear viewers, for watching another episode. Until next time.